So this is going to be the first episode of a slightly different style of video. Basically, rather than just focusing on one long topic for eight minutes, I'm gonna to try to break them up into three or four minute segments, just to keep the videos and arguments made in the videos a bit more concise. And in this episode, we're gonna be comparing Scott McTominay with a former Everton and Manchester United player, but that comes after the first three or four minutes where I just give my afterthoughts to the Brentford game. But before I get into that, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's video, UFO Soccer. I myself picked up this Portugal 2006 jersey with C. Ronaldo on the back, number 17. And for Atlantis football customers, UFO Soccer is offering a massive deal. You can buy two jerseys and get one free, or you can buy four jerseys and get two free. You can buy six jerseys and get three jerseys free, alongside free shipping. And if you really want to, you can buy eight jerseys and get four jerseys completely free. When you buy your jersey for the free jersey, you just need to write the size and a link to the free jersey that you want on the payment screen. The free jerseys won't include customization, the patches or retro jerseys. I'll leave all the information you need linked in the description. The offer will end on the 16th of October and if you use coupon code ATL, you'll also get 10% off as well. But this Portugal Ronaldo jersey has to be one of my all-time favourites in my collection. So if you want to pick up a cheap, great quality football jersey, click the link in the description and remember to use a coupon code as well for 10% off. The 2-1 comeback win against Brentford over the weekend is eerily reminiscent of the 3-2 comeback win against Newcastle back in the 2018-2019 season, at the end of Jose Mourinho's tenure, with United making a comeback at Old Trafford after a disappointing performance on the day, which had been just one episode in a series of poor results. Played over the same weekend as well, 6th of October in 2018, and 7th of October on Saturday, it was a forgotten man in the form of Scott McTominay who rescued United with two late goals, just as it had been five years earlier with Alexis Sanchez's 90th minute header, securing all three points. After United had gone 2-0 down inside 10 minutes, with Kennedy and Muto silencing the Old Trafford crowd. However, a miraculous comeback shouldn't be taken for granted as a catalyst for a turnaround in form, as despite this result at the start of October 2018, after a rather embarrassing 3-1 loss to Liverpool, Jose Mourinho would be sacked on the 18th of December that very same year. But to be fair, I think you do have to give Ten Hag the benefit of the doubt, as despite the similarities between 2023 and 2018, the context is very different. Mourinho was into his third season, compared to Ten Hag's second. And like with many of Mourinho's tenures, as it was with Real Madrid and Chelsea in the second stint, Mourinho does have this weird third season syndrome. Although the fact that both Mourinho and now Ten Hag were and are coming off the back of pretty chaotic summer transfer windows is probably not the best sign. Whilst Ten Hag did get four major targets, the fact that Amrabat Hoyland and Mason Mount really have only been introduced to the starting eleven in the last few weeks also has to be taken into account. Add on to this the insane injury fever that has hit Carrington, along with the whole Jaden Sancho situation which I think Ten Hag has handled to the best of his abilities, and I think it would be unfair to not provide some sort of leniency to Ten Hag, despite the disastrous start to the season which can't be disputed, and that is mostly down to his impressive first season, where he did manage to secure top 4 fairly comfortably and also win the League Cup, whilst also getting to the FA Cup final as well, where he was rather let down by his keeper something that he's probably getting used to. Despite me definitely saying that Ten Hag needs time, I do accept that at a club like United, regardless of who the owners are, there is always going to be a greater degree of pressure. I think United are amongst a select group of five super clubs in world football, and the other four are Real Madrid, Barcelona, Bayern Munich and PSG. I think with these four and Manchester United making it five, there is something greater at play. Any pressure periods or bad form that a manager can experience for short periods are magnified significantly. Think Nagelsmann at Bayern Munich last year. Any PSG manager straight after an exit from the Champions League. Practically anyone who isn't Carlo Ancelotti or Zinedine Zidane at Real Madrid. Every Barcelona manager who isn't friends with Pep or every Manchester United manager. The comparisons are obvious and I don't think you can change that. You just have to adapt slightly differently to other clubs. Brighton are able to lose 6-1 to Aston Villa, have a bad match of the day, but have moved past it by the Tuesday, whereas any loss for United hangs over the team until at least one victory can surpass it. And so a series of losses can plunder any Manchester United manager into a crisis, even if they did have an impressive first season, and are just 10 games into the new season, as Eric Ten Hag is. 
So I think everyone in football has now mutually agreed to give the green light for the McTominay at striker experiment. I mean, if he leaves United likely at the end of the season and hasn't been given a run of games up top, I will be disappointed. And whilst it is almost a meme at this point, I actually think a position change for McTominay has real validity. After all, he scored too many perfectly struck shots from the edge of the box, amongst others that he scored for his goal scoring prowess to be certainly more than just a fluke. And the stats back this up as over the last 365 days, when compared against every other midfielder in Europe's top 5 leagues, McTominay ranks in the 99th percentile for both his non-penalty goals and his non-penalty XG, whilst also overperforming his non-penalty XG by 0.10 per 90, given a non-penalty goal scoring rate of 0.39 per 90. Let's assume that McTominay would be able to maintain this goal scoring rate over the course of a 40 game season for example, which of course is a massive assumption, he would have a total around 15 or 16 goals. Right now McTominay is scoring at a rate of a goal every two and a half games. And remember, this is coming from a fairly deep midfield position. And with United only having a woefully out of form Anthony Martial as a backup to Rasmus Hoyland this season, surely Ten Hag has to cave to the wishes of the football manager gods at some point in the season. But of course, it isn't as simple as just sticking McTominay up front and hoping for the best. And so we actually need to establish what sort of centre forward role he would play and how the tactical setup may have to be adapted to get the best out of him by getting him into optimal goal scoring positions. McTominay actually reminds me of a former United player, though not for his spell at Old Trafford. From 2011 to 2013 under David Moyes at Everton, Maran Fellaini was in his peak. Signed as a 21 year old defensive midfielder in 2008 from Anderlecht, by 2012 Fellaini was more of a second striker target man, playing in behind Jelovic with Steven Pienaar to his left. Fellaini was used as almost a centerpiece of David Moyes' functional 4 4 1 1. Now, Ten Hag certainly can't make McTominay the centerpiece of United's attack, but he can look at how Moyes utilised Fellaini in possession, particularly in the final third. And two of Fellaini's best performances in an Everton shirt came against Manchester United, both in 2012. The first came in the run-in towards the end of the 2011-2012 season, where Fellaini would be playing a crucial role in Steven Pienaar's late equaliser, which would see the game finish 4-4. This is definitely an aspect of his game that McTominay would have to develop, but considering his stature and physicality, along with the fact that he's actually very good in terms of his ball control when he's receiving the ball in crowded positions around the box, makes me feel like McTominay could perform the role of a target man or deeper line forward to a decent standard. When United have the ball in the final third, McTominay can provide a similar sort of option to the one that someone like Olivier Giroud would, dropping off from the forward line around the box, laying off the ball first time, but also dragging centre-backs out of the back line, creating space for the likes of Mount Rashford and Bruno Fernandes to run into. But like Fellaini, McTominay could also be a serious goal-scoring threat inside of the box as well. Alongside his goal-scoring, his aerial ability also stands out statistically when we look at his FB ref report, which combined with the same sort of technique and composure that Fellaini showed to score against United in that 4-4 game makes McTominay not just a threat with his head but also a threat when just receiving the ball in the box period because of his ability to shift the ball into a shooting position and how accurate and clinical his shooting is. Now we'll do a further video where I go into more detail about how Scott McTominay could potentially be used as a centre forward looking at the tactical side in more detail but I think the way Maran Fellaini played for Everton back in 2011-2012 is exactly how Ten could potentially use Scott McTominay towards the end of games where United are struggling to break down a deep compact defensive unit and can use both McTominay and Hoyland as physical battering rams either in the air or by playing balls into their feet where they can look to link the play and as Scott McTominay's goal scoring ability has shown he can certainly provide a significant goal scoring threat in the opposition's box. 